Though he would shudder to hear it said, Tim Wallace is the sort of bloke that legends are made of. He's a man who took his weekend hobby of deer shooting and created a multi-million dollar industry around it. A man who was one of the first to see the extraordinary future for an animal once regarded as a noxious pest and a machine that many saw as just an expensive toy. Tim Wallace, helicopters and deer, starts some 30 years ago. Tim then saw the potential for venison, but also found it expensive and difficult to bring the carcasses out of the bush. His long-time fascination with flying helped him find a solution. I guess uh, I just love helicopters, but uh, they're not a plaything. The helicopter was the chain, the link between the mountains and the factories. And then, of course, uh, with the live deer, the transition from the venison through to the live, again, it's been the key. There wouldn't be a deer farming industry without helicopters. Tim was in at the very beginning of that industry in the 1950s. He was one of the first to see that helicopters were perfect for deer recovery. As a hunting machine, they were quick and highly maneuverable and the development of the powerful Hughes 300 and 500 choppers meant that large numbers of deer could easily be brought out of the bush. At the same time as the first experimental shoot and recovery operations were taking place using choppers, a massive campaign was underway to cut back deer numbers in New Zealand's native forests. There they were seen as a destructive, noxious animal. Because of the difficult terrain and the sheer size of the operation, little venison was actually brought out, just the deer tails as evidence. To Tim Wallace, that was an enormous waste, especially as he knew the capabilities of choppers and the potential for venison. I found at that stage that what we were doing by just bringing back a tail to sell to the Chinese or a bit of antler if it's in the right season, it was one hell of a waste. So uh, I used to bring back some um, uh, venison for the local butcher and he actually made the best sausages on the west coast. Um, so <coughs> it started really with um, looking at the waste that was really there and uh, um, could it be uh, used. And that's where an old hunting crony of Tim stepped in. Robert Wilson had set up a local deer recovery operation. And to get the green light to export to Germany in the United States, he organized a trial shipment, using his family's hunting lodge in Wanaka as the processing plant for the deer carcasses. They were brought into this room 
and one by one on this table and with this knife, which I still have, they were cut, dissected and made into their various cuts, which was later sent to uh, the American market. Uh, although uh, my mother was away at the time and we confidently were able to use this table, we still thought we'd put a, a sheet down, but after the first incision was made, uh, the sheet was useless. Nevertheless, we proceeded and the cuts were prepared. Uh, Tim and I thought, well, it'd be a great idea if someone could uh, utilize a helicopter and for bringing deer out of the valleys. So after considerable thought, we hired a MASH type Korean helicopter. It was assembled and flown on to the operational site up in the mountains nearby, where we had a line of shooters who had gone out the day before, had driven deer into a valley, and in the morning we had another line of shooters walking up the valley. The aftermath of it was that 300 deer were shot at, around 200 were shot, most of which were recovered by the helicopter. Uh, although the return wasn't great, we had proved a point. Hiring helicopters proved too expensive, so Tim took a quickie flying course, bought his own machine, and one of his first passengers was the ever-trusting Robert Wilson. It was just like another adventure with Tim, really, and I've been in several adventures. When we came into land, instead of a, a hover and a quiet settle, we came in like a toboggan, because Tim had graduated uh, from a fixed-wing aircraft to learning to try to fly a helicopter. But uh, I was quietly confident, nevertheless, because we've been through a lot of adventures together and we've had no major disasters. And Tim was very confident. It's that confidence which has built the Wallace Deer Empire. It's one of the country's biggest, with some 7,000 deer on two properties, covering over 3,000 hectares. This is Cripple Park near Wanaka where Wapiti and Red Deer have been bred with imports from Canada, England, Denmark and Sweden. Nowadays such farms are common enough, but when Tim started out, deer were still seen as a noxious animal. The seed was first sown on my uh, head with Bill Bong, a Chinese, uh, who originated from mainland China, uh, was in Hong Kong, and uh, he said in 1965, Tim, why can't you always uh, get me velvet uh, this size? And I said, they only have velvet that size five days a year. And he said, well, that's when I want it. Uh, and I said, well, the only way we can do that is, to, is to, uh, um, to, to farm them. And I said that jokingly. And he said, well, why not? Because in China, uh, that's what my ancestors were doing, and that's all we farm deer for. So I, I, I believe that was the first uh, start that get, uh, made me think about uh, farming. The early 70s saw a boom in the export of feral venison. At its peak, some 130,000 carcasses were sent overseas in a single year. As the wild deer herds were depleted, deer farming became increasingly attractive. There was an urgent need to develop good live capture techniques, and the helicopter hunters found a new weapon, the tranquilizer dart. Later on, the dart was fitted with a radio transmitter, which, once embedded in the deer, emitted a pulse. The target could then be tracked deep into the bush until the animal was knocked out by the tranquilizer and could be picked up. The most successful method of live deer capture was the net gun. Either handheld or skid mounted, it was a safe, reliable, and humane technique. At the peak of live capture operations, Tim's team were responsible for rounding up between 30 and 50 percent of all deer now on New Zealand farms, and he even exported some of the feral animals to Taiwan. The boom in feral venison exports and later in live capture saw a parallel boom in helicopter operations. Since the late 60s, Tim has managed several companies, including Alpine Helicopters and the Helicopter Line. At their peak, they boasted 35 machines. But, as capture operations have decreased and as Tim's farming interests have developed, that side of the business has been cut back.
It's been 18 years since Tim's choppers first got off the ground, and in that time, he's placed his faith in his right-hand man, Don Sparry. Don's a former flying instructor who's valued for his calm approach and his critical judgment. He sees his relationship with Tim as a perfect pairing of temperaments. His determination and single-mindedness and his absolute belief in deer uh, has got him into some problems. <laughs> and single-mindedness always has some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, he's benefited from the advantages and he's also suffered some of the disadvantages. Which brings us on to his accidents. Uh, people looking at someone like Tim in the accidents might wonder if he's a bit of a daredevil, is he? Uh, no, he's not reckless. Uh, Tim is, uh, as I say, single-minded. He pushes himself far too far, and that is the secret of his success and many of the good things. It unfortunately has occasionally led to some accidents, which he and I discuss on a pretty friendly basis. Those accidents have failed to put a dent in Tim's enthusiasm for flying. He keeps his own machine at home and uses it to keep in touch with various business ventures scattered throughout the country. Looks like Nick, we've got to do these checks now. And keeping the helicopter at home also means Tim's sons get an early grounding and chopper maintenance. Check those pitch links are right, Nick. And the bearings. That's all good. Nick, uh, you do the fuel drain, just check there's no water in it. Seven-year-old Nick is becoming a skilled junior mechanic. Well, at least he knows kerosene when he smells it. You got the right one? Yep. Kerosene? Yep. As one of the pioneer chopper pilots, Tim has had his share of crashes including his very first machine, written off after just 10 days. Very seldom the machine lets uh, you down. It's usually you let the machine down. But, um, you know, I've had a crankshaft fail in flight uh, just as I was, you know, just about across Tiana and I, you know, we just got to the shore then and a conrod went in another time and a valve. Well, those are mechanical failures. Now, I've been through two sets of wires, um, one uh, a telephone link between a backcountry farm across a river from a bluff down to a tree. Well, I guess that's, uh, that's just a hazard. Um, the other one, into high tension wires, uh, I didn't see them. I didn't know that the power to Queenstown went around the back and it was uh, in snowy conditions and, uh, you know, I just went into them. That smash was in 1968 when Tim and other pilots were feeding out emergency hay rations to sheep stranded by snow high above Queenstown. About 150 feet above the ground, we hit the wires. Uh, helicopter rose, got all tangled up in it. And then uh, there was a long way between there and the ground. And uh, I think there was a few words spoken as we went down. <laughs> you know, we were obviously uh, not pleased. And um, the lights went out, I guess. Uh, and my first reaction um, was, how is everyone else? But it's a natural thing, I guess. Um, Lynn Heron. He was, um, he had bowled out the front and he was able to um, get help. Um, but um, Dick Burton and myself, we had um, spinal injuries and we couldn't uh, move. That was it. He was just as enthusiastic, just as determined, as far as he could see, he was going to be out of that hospital, back on the job, doing his thing and doing it well. And did it affect his social life at all? He was determined to enjoy that just as much, and we helped as much as we could, I can remember. Uh, we helped him escape a t couple of times from the hospital by borrowing the operation theatre trolley, putting him on it, and uh, pushing him at breakneck speed down various streets to where we had uh, a party here and there with various friends. Then we had the problem of getting him back unseen, which uh, didn't always work. Why did you put sticks in the bird pistol? But despite the hijinks, Tim spent many months in hospital learning to walk again. He was driven by two things, sheer necessity and a natural optimism. Well, I never ever believed it. And, uh, you know, I was always going to get right. I was too busy to be, to be a crook. So um, I don't think it was till six months later that I realised things weren't um, repairing like I imagined. And I did believe that maybe I will have a disability. But I certainly didn't uh, uh, ever think of it while I was in hospital. 
How did you go about getting back on your feet again? Well, <laughs> um, that was one of the times that my accountant says that we were bankrupt. And because uh, both um, Bill Black, um, he pranged uh, a couple of weeks after me, and that was 50% of the fleet down. And uh, um, I was too busy to be really too worried about uh, um, not getting better. After the accident, more than ever before, the helicopter became Tim's means of freedom and escape. These trips into the mountains are an essential part of the Tim Wallace philosophy. In an attempt to get the balance right, Tim juggles his recreation, his work and his family. Prue, you're the last one there, so I'll, uh, the sausages are on the okay. thing. That means setting time aside to relax with his wife Prue and their four sons. Matthew and Nick, who are still at home, and Toby and Jonathan, who are at boarding school. Leg break. Millie, 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 millie. What's the matter? Where'd your leg break? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the balance to me is, uh, you know, family, friends, the business, uh, flying, obviously, um, uh, sport like diving. Now. To me, if I can put all that combina uh, combination together uh, in the right proportions, you know, then I've, then I've worked it well. Tim's balancing act includes his sporting pursuits, and since his accident, he's discovered diving. Most often, it's from his boat, the Ranganui, which serves as a launch pad for Tim's Fiordland operations. He's using choppers here as scouts, patrolling the vast area of the park where special traps have been laid to capture deer. The traps carry a radio transmitter, which emits a slow beep when dormant. They're activated when an animal steps over the trigger wire set in the bush, and that also triggers the radio transmitter. Up in the helicopter, the hunters register that change in signal and come down to pick up the deer. This trapping technique was specially developed by Tim's company for use in the wild, mountainous terrain of Fiordland National Park. Tim believes there are still thousands of feral deer grazing the three million acre area. But as earlier capture operations have forced the deer deeper into the bush, he's had to find a method which could be used in such conditions.
traps are also designed to meet the environmental demands of the national park. When dormant, the nets blend with the forest cover, and when triggered by the deer, they cause little injury to the animal. Tim also hopes it'll be much more economic to operate the deer recovery nets instead of the random and expensive helicopter pursuit of feral deer. Over the next year or so, he hopes to place some 400 traps throughout the country, at the cost of probably $1,000 each, but maybe less once bulk production is underway. Tim hopes these traps will then supply all the deer needed to run his farming operations. Once captured and recovered, the animals are flown back to one of the floating chopper pads moored in the sounds. After a period of rest and recovery, the animals are then flown to one of Tim's deer farms. This is Mararoa near Te Anu, where Tim runs 23,000 stock units, a mixture of deer, sheep and cattle. Most deer runs are intensively grazed, but with this extensively farmed property, Tim wants to prove that deer do best on an open range, similar to their natural environment. It's this courage to experiment which makes Tim such a successful farmer, and it's his lifelong admiration for deer that means he wants to see them perform at their very best. I guess, uh, you know, Ever since I was legal to have a rifle, they've, you know, there's been that, that attraction. I know I'm a hunter at heart, and uh, there's been many challenges that they've given me, you know, right throughout, from the days when I, I first shot till, till the helicopter days. And really, when you're looking at the farming side, in 20 years, or in, say, 15 years of farming, a noxious animal has really been changed into a national asset. Tim has always ranked deer above all other animals. I think when you look back into the, right throughout history, uh, whether it be China, Europe, uh, Persia, Egypt, uh, Britain, uh, it's always been, in, in those years, the animal of the kings. It's an ex extremely noble animal, and those of us that have farmed them uh, know that they're very special. And that compliment could equally apply to Tim Wallace, Prince of the Chopper Pilots, King of the Deer Farmers.